only breathe oxygen like everyone else does. I only have two legs like every other player has in my team. But if you sign with to be my teammate, you better make sure that you live up to the expectations I have to myself and to you. Because otherwise you will have a big, big problem. It's Football Friday, and that means another episode of Across the Line. Today, we got a legend, a living legend of the game here in the Philippines. Four-time Philippines Football League winner, reigning golden ball. Uh, Mr. Football, several times, he's coming back for his second time on the show. Stefan Schrock is here. Chris, I'm pumped up. You know, after speaking to the man himself, I'm feeling pretty pumped up about myself. Yeah, brilliant to have him on again. He was uh, great value when he came on, uh, the first ever across the line um, guest. And um, it, it's great to catch up with him. Obviously, we're talking more along the lines of this particular uh, PFL campaign, where again, he, he lit up the league, his team UCFC uh, dominated the proceedings. But it was also nice to sort of hear the backstory, how much he enjoyed being in the bubble and, and mixing with, with some of the other teams. Um, sharing with us some of his coaching experiences. That was a really fun insight that he gave us. And then also the plans for the future, which at the moment is, is still a little bit unclear, but he sort of talked a little bit about uh, some of the decisions that he has to make and, and his plans for what he has moving forward. So uh, all in all, another fantastic opportunity to speak with, um, with Shrocky and, and, and get that, get an opportunity to delve into the psyche of, of one of the greatest players that uh, the Philippines have ever had. That was a big one for me. It was my first time really speaking to Stefan and to, to get a peek into his mind was a real treat. So we hope you enjoy this episode with the guy who's going to be the greatest ever in the world of Philippine football. Uh, if you do, please do subscribe to the show on YouTube, Spotify, and on Apple Podcasts. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and on Instagram for social media. Drop us a line there. We'd appreciate it very much. And without further ado, it's Stefan Schrock here on Across the Line. The champ is here. Four-time winner of the Philippines Football League and reigning Golden Ball winner is with us on the show, Stefan Schrock. Welcome back to Across the Line. Hey, everyone. Oh, Chris, Jing, nice to see you all. Uh, my, my first time, actually. My first time uh, getting the pleasure of speaking with you. But Christopher, you have a, a long history with Stefan Schrock here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, colorful history with him. Played with him, played uh, against him coached against him, watched him win titles. So yeah, uh, we've uh, and, and had the pleasure of having him on the podcast as well. So we had the, uh, the backstory, which was um, the first ever episode that we put out. And um, even now I get people talking about that episode, saying how they learned so many uh, interesting things about his, his backstory, things that we didn't really know. And we got to know the man behind the, behind the gorilla. So it's, uh, it's nice that we get to speak to him again because obviously a lot's happened in the past sort of 14, 15 months since we spoke last. I wasn't involved in the, in the podcast yet prior uh, in that episode. I have to say that was one of my favorite ones. Um, got me an opportunity to understand uh, the personality behind Stefan Schrock. Obviously, just a man who was delivering all the heartbreak to Kaya over the years. So it's difficult to get to understand, you know, uh, who he is underneath, but um, that was a, a really revealing interview and a, a more of an understanding of your love for the Philippines and the game here. So if you guys are interested in that, definitely an episode to look back on. But today we catch up with Stefan Schrock on the back of another successful campaign. There were some, how should you say, there were some doubts from the outside looking in, I suppose, because, you know, um, you weren't in the country yet. Uh, the rumblings were that UCFC were not yet as organized as the other clubs yet when the whistle blew and the game started it was the same result you guys were untouchable for the most part and you got yourself another championship so how does it feel on the back end of that um uh, your accomplishments again and uh, the whole experience tell us a little bit about your thoughts on that yeah, well um it was a tough year for everyone i think uh that the pfl just had to or could kickstart a, a league is, is unbelievable you know um we have to give credit to to the pfl they get hammered for for doing uh or for not delivering but this times we have to pay them credit as well um, because pulling off a league in this time is, is absolutely amazing and uh, in the end of the day no one would really care about the format about the bubble about everything that uh was was uh more or less 
a bumper on the road for, for the players are uh, a not familiar situation for us. But uh, credits to them, credits to all the owners and players making this happening because we worked all hand in hand for this event. And uh, as you mentioned, we, we came up uh, on top of this. I had never a doubt that we will win the league. Like uh, this is external thoughts. Um, having my internal thoughts and internal conversations and I am absolutely convinced, I was absolutely convinced the whole year that whenever the league will kick off, we will come out on top like we always do. I mean, we all, yeah, ahead, we, all saw the, we all saw the social media posts in that sort of lockdown period where it was fairly unsure as to what was going to be happening with the league, but you were very bullish about the fact that, you know, you were going to win the title, irrespective of whether it was going to be as a Ceres player or UCFC player, when that whole situation was starting to unravel. So when the announcement was made and, and you came up, I remember you, you put out a post about saying that we, you know, we are now, you know, you, you've signed the, uh, the, the, the title favourites. And this was, I think you was on vacation somewhere with a, with a bottle of champagne in, in your hand. And obviously like you put that out and you laid down that marker straight away. And we even commented it on the show, but, but what was it then? That, that gave you that confidence? Because obviously you're on a beach somewhere, you're on vacation, yet your mind is still on winning the title. So what, what gave you that, that confidence, did you think, to, to, to sort of give that message straight? And, and ultimately deliver us. I'm like a little kid, 34 years, but I'm still using my imagination to, to put me into places I feel I feel these things that are going, ha going to happen, that we will win the title. I live in that. Like 20 hours a day, I think of how I'm going to approach this, how I'm going to improve this part of the game. Where do, I, where do I have room for improvement or what do I really good? And uh, like I said, these things and I'm, I'm bored. You know, I'm scoring the times already. I, who cares if I do win another title or not? I work very, very hard and I have always a vision and always a goal in mind and that that is what gives me this confidence. The work ethic and the visualization. Very interesting, you know. Um, perhaps here in the Philippines, it's not something that we're, we're used to having a personality that is so brash about um, success and the potential success that they're going to have in the future. Have you found that you've gotten any pushback from that, from, from the public? Um, here in the Philippines, they have that culture where it's like, um, they don't like people who are mayabang, you know? They don't, they don't like that. But it's different when you deliver also, right? And I think, I think that's where people are starting to understand that you can be confident, you can be brash if you put in the work. So what has your experience been having that kind of personality and persona online? That's not just online, the character. That's, uh, that's me, you know. A lot of people, they, they have these beliefs, they have these thoughts also that they're going to... I'm not saying I'm the only one working out during the lockdown or I'm the only person uh, having... So be really good players. Like uh, Kaya team, they have a bunch of bunch of uh, talented, crafty players. Uh, only in my team, we have a lot of good players. We have stallions working so so hard on and off the pitch with Coach Ernie. Obviously, he's like a he's like a, a drill instructor to me. You know, and um, I'm just vocal with it. You know, I'm not scared to say what I think and what I feel. And uh, eventually, that's why. I'm a little bit, or white team is a little bit ahead of the of the game because it filters down, you know. Uh, when you lead a team, you have to be aware of your responsibilities and you have to back it up. And I back it up in work rate, in being a role model, and I'm embracing it. I'm not shying away from it. Do, do you think obviously on Instagram or on Facebook, I get a lot of messages from, let's say, Kaya fans after, I don't know if you saw the post where I put... Um, Eventually, it was Giganto, I think. Uh, yeah, it was Giganto. I said, I can accelerate faster on the ball and someone can blink. And it just happened to be him. And a lot of 
uh, Kaya fans felt felt free to put me something in the inbox to drop me some nice messages, you know. <laughs> but in the end of the day, I don't care, you know. I have blinkers on. I, I just focus on my thing and uh, I think I back it up every time when we go out there and play. Do you think it has an effect on the opponents? Do you think that people are looking at you, you the sort of the nature of the post the nature of the confidence and do you think there is a psychological element that um it affects the opponent in your opinion i certainly look to go under the skin of my opponents uh, leading up to the league weeks prior to that i will start putting out mind games for them let's say for example simone um, I visit him a lot, see him a lot because of the girl uh, in the orphanage we tried to adapt. And I would just randomly put, put Simone and tell him, like, meet the last game of the league, game day five. Remember that when it's 60 minutes played, your body will scream for your oxygen and I will be still fresh, I have the better legs, I have the better preparation. You know I'm going to cut inside. Deliver on the second post. There will be Bienville or Mandy putting it away 2 nil for us. I would start doing this to them, you know, or to Harvey on that inside bubble thing. I would, I would tell them, you know what's going to happen. You will chasing ghosts out there. Like, you will shadow chasing all 90 minutes. You will not touch the ball. You're a fanboy. If I mean it like that, I don't know. Who knows? But it's in their head. It's in their head. And that's, that's a big side Psychological wise, it's a big, big thing, you know, because we are, the Philippine culture is, is a humble one. I would almost say, I'm not mean it in a man, in a mean way or something, but that's not who I am. I put my will on my opponents and I make them think and feel what I want. From, from the outside looking in, like I, I enjoy it. You know what I mean? Like I enjoy that element of the sort of the back and forth, the mind game. It's something I miss because obviously when you grow up, especially in Europe, there's always stuff with coaches. There's always stuff, you know, the press conference and someone will say something and someone will retaliate. Like there doesn't seem to be like that, that so much of that here in the Philippines. I mean, even like you look at the boxing scene, I mean, we all love boxing. Everyone on this, on this interview here, we all love boxing. And like even Pacquiao doesn't even engage in that sort of thing. Like he's not one to, to do that. You know what I mean? He's, he's very much of the Philippine culture. But if, if you had his sort of talent as a boxer, like, I mean, your, your ego would be out the door, wouldn't it? I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't even be able to fit in any, any, any room. You know, it, it would just be impossible. So... I, for one, I really enjoy it. Like, I enjoyed the back and forth. And I think it's something that needs to be fostered because at the end of the day, that's what creates the rivalries. That's what gets other fans hating you, sending you the messages in the inbox. But that's what you want. You, you don't want to like everyone. You don't want it to be a nice, friendly family in, because that's not what stokes the imagination of, of the public. So, you know, I, for one, it, I really enjoyed it. And then the second element to that is, is obviously people have to toughen up to that because if you're going to let someone send a message or put a post out on social media and it affects you, you're never going to, you're never going to develop. You're never going to get to the, to the next level anyway. Do you know what I mean? So you, you have these mind games and, and you have to be able to take that and, and even engage or stand up to it. And what was quite interesting, we spoke to Scott Cooper yesterday and the first game against UCFC, I think it, it did get to them. You know, it did get to a few of their guys. It did lead to that. Um, I mean, the example he gave was a lot of them were just trying to stand up for themselves and they forgot that was, you actually had to play football as well. You know, it's not in a playground where you just have to stand up to the big bad bully. You actually have to play football as well. So, I mean, did you get any pushback from, from that sense? Like where the players had got to the point where the, it, they, it just boiled over and they actually weren't able to focus on the football? Yeah, as you mentioned, the, the first game, ADT, it's the best example, probably, you know. They, they do have a lot of quality players in, in their squad. They do have a very, very good coach. You know it yourself, like, Scott is very, very well prepared when he goes to the pitch. Like, he details, highlights every, everything. Your weaknesses, he will expose. And the strength, he will, he will try to manage to not highlight 
or emphasize on that too much, you know. So half of the team was just focus of ADT, I would say, to stand up to me. There were, whatever situation it was, we got together, there was like a tackle or something that we just try to man up. But it's different, you know, if you try to be a character or you put that mask on for the 90 minutes or if you live that day in, day out. So I think, I think that's a difference. They focus, they focus on, on uh, standing up, on, on fighting back, on uh, talking shit back to me. But in the end of the day, what did they do? Nothing. They were not focused on their game. They were not, like they look good in defense, but offense-wise, what was it? They barely crossed the half line. So mission accomplished, I would say. <laughs> Yeah, that was a very interesting match to watch because a lot of those guys were your, you know, teammates prior just a year ago. You know, you're nurturing them, you're, you're encouraging them, you're telling them uh, to stand up and, and, and stay strong and in the tough moments. On this occasion, you were the one mouthing off to them. In fact, you were one of the first ones. Uh, first tackle came in, you were already letting them know um, that this was not a friendly um, coming together. Um, did they get put off by that or were they expecting that you were going to be more adversarial uh, on, on this occasion because it looked like some of them were shocked that, you know, Jesus, like, relax, Stefan. Like, you're really coming on strong here, and I'm only 21. Do you think that's, that's a benefit to them, something that they can take and grow from? Well, certainly they will grow from it. Like, you saw they, their second game was against Kaya, wasn't it? Mm. They did well there. They looked good. If it wouldn't be that mistake from, uh, I think... Piano was it? Piano, yeah. Piano. Like, it made the ball a long ball, and then uh, Kenny put it away in a, in a nice fashion. I have to admit, um, they look good. They look good. They they learn fast. Like I said, they they learn fast. They're very close to my heart. They're kids. They chasing their dreams. You know, how can you not like somebody having the same goal as you have? It's just like business for us. I want to get the three points. There's nothing personal in it. I wish them well every every time I watch them play. Um, it's it's nice because they're like my brothers, my little my little sons. I would say, um, in sense of the age gap we have between each other. But I wish them well, and I see a lot of potential in there. So if they just focus putting in the work and and um, developing a character, a pers persona, which comes over the year automatically, um, become vocal with their dreams. You know, you you what, what is wrong? with saying what you want. Like, I want a truckload of money after my career. What's wrong with that to say that? Or what, what is wrong to say I'm the best in, best in the ADT team? Why? Why not? What's wrong with it? Because people say you're cocky or you're overconfident or eventually you have to back it up anyways. That's why people fail because they reach for here and end up there. I reach for there and end eventually up there. So I'm gunning for 10 and end up with a nine, which is still good. Others go for a five and end up with a four, which is average. Mm. So job done for you. Another title in the bag. Uh, but the reward this year is one bigger than one that you've received over the last three years. This time you guys get to go to the Champions League now. Um, is that something that you're looking ahead to and excited for already? Because there's a lot of question marks regarding what squad we're going to see for United City next year uh, that will compete in this most prestigious of tournaments in this continent? Well, I don't, I don't even know if I will be there next year for United City. We, we are still in ongoing talks and um, a final stay on that has my family because they've been uh, pushing back their sacrificing their family time and their dreams or their uh, motivations for my career for the most of the time for like 18 years straight my wife I don't even know how many times she had to sacrifice for my for my future for my career for my dream and they will have the last say you know I had an interview the other day with with someone in uh, from Germany German newspaper he said like you know uh, you won uh, the MVP award twice in a row you won the PBL uh, PFL trophy four times in a row. You got a first ever Filipino to score at the Asian Cup in the Europa League in there, in this, in this, and this. He put out all my records. 
And he goes, in the end of the day, he said, you put yourself in a situation where is nowhere else to go than downwards. You know, he's saying like, I'm at the pinnacle. Where, where to go from now on? What to win? What to achieve next? So I will sit back in a room, put down the curtain and plot over that with my wife. Mm -hmm. What to pull out next? Yeah, I think it's tough, isn't it? I mean, even in the interview that we did right uh, at the start when we did this podcast, it was, uh, it was very evident that it, it was something that you struggled with, that, that sort of, uh, um, I think the analogy that you gave was, I think uh, one of you just learned to walk and then you were straight out the door for a Europa League game. That was the story that you gave and it was like, oh, how many of these things am I going to have to miss? And, you know, like, like you alluded to, at the end of the day, you, your wife's been long suffering while you go off and you do, you know, you travel away and uh, you go to different countries and it's, and, and it takes their toll on them. But ultimately the other thing, the other side of the coin is we all know that you're extremely competitive, you know, and you're, you're, you're someone who I, I think, yeah, while you're all, certainly in the Southeast Asian region, you're, you're the type of personality that wants to stay there, you know, and, and, and you want, and, and you could sustain it. You know, it's not about just reaching to the top and then you go, right, okay, thanks, I'm, I'm out. You're the type of individual who, who wants to maintain that, to stay there and keep to continue to push on your legacy. So I'm interested to see how, 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 that, will, how that will develop. But if I was to play devil's advocate and, and look at that a, um, uh, UCFC squad, I mean, how, how potentially, how potentially well do you think you could fare in the, in the Champions League next year? Is, is that something that you think could be, you know, could you get out of the group stage? Do you think it'd be, it'd be a very tough task to go against some of these top Asian, Asian nations? Because you've seen them up close and personal now in, in, the, in the Asian Cup just last year. So if you were to play devil's advocate, how do you think you might potentially fare if you were to play in the Champions League next year? Well, that depends also if the squad will stay together as it is now and when we do probably need two, three more good signings uh, to have a much, much more depth in the squad. Uh, because the guys we got in were very, it's very, they're very good. Like Jordan did a good job I, for me. Uh, Cholo, he's in shape. Like, mate, he, when he gets his head in order, my God, oh my God, this kid has really, really a big potential in him. But, it will take time for him to go there to, to meet, meet this level, especially in AFC. And uh, playing Champions League was always a dream of mine. Always. Uh, um, like literally worked my whole career towards playing one day at the Champions League level because this is really very, very top of the club uh, competitions. Um, I think we can pull off some surprises. Why not? Like we, we literally... Uh, had no preparation time beating Brisbane, beating Thaiport. There were a 10 weeks uh, season. I was speaking to Martin, uh, the whole build up to this, to this game. I was like, Martin, we're going to beat, uh, I don't even know who it was, some Myanmar team in the first round, and then we're going to take you out in the second. He's like, Shraki, you're out of your mind. <laughs> You even think you come here and get some points like you were lucky if you get out like just two nil three nil because they have a, a very very good squad mm. as you see they're doing well in the thai league they have big big players there and but i was confident so i'm confident also that if we go to the afc champions league group stage we prove that we belong there i mean people look down at the pfl and say oh they expect us to win but it's not, it's not like people just hand it to us on a silver platter. No. They have, everyone has their own agenda. Everyone wants to win. Everybody wants to beat us. We have a big ass target on our backs. Every game. This is the game. This is the game of the season for them. This is the red panty night for them. You know, if they beat us, they're going to be like, that. that's a team like Kaya. They, they beat us in the last game. And uh, they ended up a two years winning streak in, in the domestic league which is unbelievable for them. You know, it's, it, I'm happy. I'm happy that it was Kaya in the end of the day because they have been the, the biggest competitor for us in the past, what, five, six years. They always manage their budget, bringing out a big, big squad, and they, they deserve a lot of credit for what they do for the Filipino community and the football community especially. And, um, yeah, we will see what, how the chips will fall, but I'm very, very confident that we don't go down and. Uh, 
being a sparring partner to the big houses in, in Asia, especially not if I sign. So a lot of things uh, still up in the air and a lot of people holding their breath for the next few months to see how, how the chips fall, as you say. But one thing is for sure, you were inside the bubble. You experienced the entire 2020 season. And for a lot of people who were inside, it felt refreshing, you know, like it was being delivered in such a manner that a lot more people could enjoy the matches. The same could not be said over the last three years, perhaps. Do you feel as if, you know, with the likes of Maharlika coming in, uh, personalities like Anton, with the teams that we had, do you feel as if there's something exciting about to happen for Philippines football in terms of uh, the, the PFL specifically in the coming years? Yes. I mean, like I said, this year's league to, to get it done in this, uh, in the style they did it was very, very, very good. Like all the players of the bubble setup brought us very close together. You know, for the first time, like I meet Paul probably 200 times. I've never had the time to sit down with him, talk for him for five minutes. We met upstairs with uh, sitting on the table and, and chatted for three hours, like how to do what. And I met Coco many times. I met Anton many times to so sit down and, and plot over things, how we can get this thing rolling, you know, because football deserves much more attention that we actually actually getting at the moment. But in order to do that, we have to deliver. We have to deliver a product to the public, which they say, fuck, without football, I can't live anymore. I want to follow. I want to see how is the team's doing? How is Harvey doing? He's a big face now in the league. Uh, with his 23, 24 years old, he did, he did well. He did well, very well on both positions, on the, on the wing back side and, and uh, especially uh, being a striker. So he brings a lot of, of fan base, Anton, hats down to Anton to, to bring in a league to play the way he played. I thought, honestly, after the second game, we will have to, to bring him in with, in a wheelchair. <laughs> it is 30 years, 38 years old. He looks fresher and, and sharper than, than half of the league. So hats down to Anton. And this is, that's personalities that, that engage the critical mass, that engage the, the people. I was speaking to some, some uh, athletes before and asked for, for the support of whoever it was, different sports, basketball, PBA players, 30, Mr. Basketball himself asked Jokoi to, to post about the league and they did it. This is simple things like everyone plays a role in there and everybody tries to make the football bigger and uh, more sustainable for, for, uh, for everyone. Because in the end of the day, like Chris is the head of the Kaya Academy. He's having like 10, 10 kids who potentially could make it to the pro league and being an Asuka player in, in, uh, in the next five, six years. Well, what will happen to them? Go to the school or there's, there is no really money in it. No one knows if the league will pull off next year or not. Or, but this is before COVID. But now we delivered a product where people are happy with it. Camera angles were right. The marketing was right. The times of the games were showing was right. The I don't I think seventy thousand watched the ADT United uh, City FC game, which is unbelievable for for Philippines, you know. And uh, I think we we on a good way as long as we work together and have the same common goal. I don't see anything that that can struggle this league. Sign. Resign. Come on, Shraki. We need you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll see about that. <laughs> um, but obviously, now that the season is done, you get an opportunity now to unwind and, and focus on other things. And we, I understand you guys were speaking quite lengthily prior to the start of this um, uh, episode that you're, you're dabbling your feet now in, in coaching. How has that experience come about? And how are you enjoying it so far? Well, I'm 34 years old. I can't play forever. Probably not as much as I wish. Um, I'm just preparing uh, an eventually coaching career for, I'm not, I'm not eventually. I'm gunning for probably in five, six years taking over the national team. I just say it. Mm. <laughs> you know, but I just want, I want to see how, how I do as a coach, you know, 
being a good football player or a great football player not eventually makes you a great coach. I found out the hard way at the first two days on the course. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there were a lot of talks like in, in Germany, back in Europe, you're allowed if you're playing longer than six years in the national team, for the national team or having 120 ga pro games, you're allowed to skip the, a the C license, go straight to the B. That's what I try to I speak to no, no, Coach Maro, Coach Aris, everyone in charge. I ask if, if there is a way where I can just jump right into the B license. That's that. It's not allowed anymore. Take the seat. You will not regret it. And I didn't. I enjoyed it. I mean, is it my favorite thing to sit 10 hours in front of the laptop? No, it is not. But eventually, I told myself it's good. And then it, it is good. It was very, very refreshing um, getting together with... Uh, I think we were 22 class in the class, hearing their points of view about um, the grassroots, about how to approach younger players, especially. I have no, I have no coaching experience at all. Like, I was there, sitting there, and listening to all of them, and I was like, "Damn it, <laughs> this is a long way to go for me." Like, I was part of the system. I'm being an assistant coach this year in, in uh, United City of C and uh, I really enjoyed it. And it's something different if you're coaching pro than coaching kids. There's so many things to, to take care of, the, the details and everything. The coach is very, very refreshing. It was, I was so grateful for all the inputs I got and especially Coach Maru and also Coach Aris. He was uh, speaking as a guest um, there and it was, it was amazing. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I wish I would, could have sit down in class with them and uh, talk after, this, after the 10 hours, after the 9 hours about football because they have, they have so much input, so much knowledge and Chris knows it himself, you know. Being a player is one thing, like you focus on what in net time, a game, a training, you, you have to focus, what is it, 25 minutes where you have actually an action, where you're on the ball, where you have to execute, the past, the skill, the technique, what is asked from you. But as a coach, you have to overlook everything. Like, is there enough cones, bips, where to line up this player after executing the pass or bring, delivering the cross or whatever it is. Is the waiting time all right? Is the, is the, the load uh, good enough for this day? There are so many things and I'm very eager to learn. Like, uh, like I said, I'm not claiming to know it all. I know very well about the game, but uh, it's very interesting to be a good student. I like it. I like to gain knowledge and I love to, to be engaged in football in, in whatever it is. Maybe I pull off as a referee next season in the PFL. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, your best friends, the referees. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm really interested to, to find out. We were talking off, off air uh, a little bit about the, the coaching course. And I, I'm really intrigued to, find, to sort of pick apart what type of coach you think you'd be. Like, you've had so many different influences, both positive and negative, especially with the national team. Um, and, and you've worked, especially in Germany, under some, some really high-profile coaches. Have, have you managed to sort of formulate that in your head a little bit? Do you have any, any ideas of what type of coach you think you'd be? I have to say, this season, I was a strict one. Like, I lose my patient real quick. <laughs> I lost it real quick, multiple times. But that's different because I, I've been with the squad for five years, the core basically stayed the same. I know why and uh, for what reason, what things happen on the pitch, off the pitch, during the trainings, you know. So I'm not sure where, where we'll end up. Eventually you'll become more calm, more um, father-like figure as a drill instructor. So I, I think I go more in the father-like figure than ending up there when I finish all the licensing as a father figure and more encouraging than putting pressure on them. Yeah. And uh, the other question I was going to ask you was like, when you go on these courses, a lot of times they try to make the distinction between being like the more coach types so of being on the pitch, on the grass, delivering the sessions, um, you know, delivering the different elements of the tactical uh, deployment that the coach is looking to do. Or do you see, would you see, like to be more of a sort of manager type? Um, in a sort of more traditional English sense, sort of more picking the team, overseeing the operation and having maybe someone else do the stuff on the grass? 
that depends on my staff, you know, uh, who's available. Um, if you are having a great uh, group of, of coaches around you, then obviously you, you can let go of things and um, just overlooking the general sessions, the general daily operation more than being really hands-on. But I, I'm, I enjoy it though, though to be hands-on, to take someone at the side and give him my input, give him my experience. Whether I'm right or wrong, <laughs> we, we will find out about that, yeah. But yeah, I love to give my input and my views on, on things. And as um, in the last two years, I took care of a lot of younger players. Like uh, for me, OJ was a project. When OJ signed with us, uh, coming over from Kaya, you know it yourself, he's a wild, he's a very, very good player, but he couldn't get his head right at the game making the right decisions, making, being composed on the ball, knowing, choosing his battles on the pitch. You know, he would take on every time he get the ball, he would just try something, something making him end up at YouTube, you know. Now, him, he's very composed. He's very smart in the way of how to crack up, crack open up a defense. He's not, he's not thinking everything has to, to end up at a goal or a cross whenever he gets the ball. He's like, he's, he's a man, he manned up, he manned up. And I enjoyed it though. I enjoyed it a lot. And uh, I think I, I can, can be a great coach at, at, uh, if I gain knowledge more and get more experience on the, on the sideline, then I would be a great coach too. A great witch coach, yeah? Oh, I, I was <laughs> I'm not sure if I could handle working with you. I mean, I reckon it'd get too competitive between the two of us if you ever worked alongside <laughs> another. But, um, no, it's really interesting. Like, I always felt with you, 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 you might not be able to gauge it just from having a conversation with someone. You, know, you see them on a persona from an Instagram post or from the television. But having been in close proximity with you, like I could see even when we'd be in camps together, you know, you, you might pull someone to one side. or It might be just a casual conversation at the breakfast table and something that you say, you could see that it would resonate with that person. You know, it, it's, and it's a, it's a skill, it's an ability that only certain people have. And I think you, it's something that you have in abundance, like that sort of uh, gravitas, that personality that you have. I think it, it rubs off really well in people, especially within your circle. It might rub people off the wrong way if you're not within the confines of that circle. But if you're with, within those boundaries then then I think it's it's like gold dust do you know what I mean and people can people can feel that and if you can impart especially your your positive energy on other people around you you know then I think that's that's what's going to forge a really strong bond between you and player like I look at for example Scott and, and one of the reasons why I think you and Scott got along so well was, was was because of that it was like two kind of titans two quite sort of powerful personalities but there was no bs everyone could be truthful with one another and you both sort of played off of each other with that sort of dynamic and i think if you could have that as a head coach with exactly what you said with oj similar type of personality but you've got to try to get them to see your point of view then i think the 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 outcome could be could be monumental i'm just a bit nervous now it, it, this this could be a big meteor that's going to be hitting uh, in the philippines very soon and uh, we're not, we're not quite ready for it. But I'm hoping it's in a few years' time, Gene, because we, we certainly have, don't want to see the last of him on the pitch, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, 34 is still young, right? Well, yeah, well, 34 is, is a number in the end of the day, you know? I mean, look at Zlatan, look at uh, Cristiano Ronaldo. I'm not saying I'm, I am like them or I can beat them or something. I'm on my own journey here, but... It seems like uh, 34 is the new 30 at the moment. So I feel pretty comfortable. I'm, I'm not slacking off the work yet. I'm not feeling too comfortable with what I have achieved. I'm still hungry for more. But like I said, the final word on that is given to my family. Right. Um, so, yeah. One of the things that w was really uh, shocking to me, I suppose, was that it was such a compressed schedule the PFL last, the last season, and United City played their strongest 11 every match. I think you played 90 minutes in all of them. And I was thinking, like, at what point do your legs start giving out? Like, is it going to start to show in the fourth game? Is it going to start to show in the third game? And I never really saw it, 
right? Even in the fifth game against Kaya, you played the whole, whole match. So, so, like, what do you do? Like, what do you do to make sure that your, your body's in, in shape? Like, what's a regular day for Stefan Schrock? Well, Jing, I'm not, like I said, I'm not just throwing words out. I live for football. Football gave me literally everything. Whatever I eat, whatever I drink, wherever I stay, what blanket I'm using, what brief I'm wearing today, the socks, the whatever it is, I owe it to football. So why not living for football? I, I eat good, I drink good, I sleep well. I'm eating vegan towards a competition. Like literally just starting to eat meat now. I had like my 10 days in Germany where, where I cheated a little bit after I arrived. But then I felt like that's not me. That's not with what I'm happy with, you know? It's like you're starving for something. Going back, you have it three, four times and then you think like, is it, is it helping me? Is it, is it something that brings me to where I want to end up end of the season being the MVP and winning the title? No. Nope. So I disregard this. I just don't eat it anymore. I just focus on what brings me step by step closer to what I want to be and where I want to end up. And I said it before, you, if you eat, like if you put in the work, the only thing that comes out is results in the end of the day. Like everyone is claiming it. Everyone is claiming it. They want to win this. They want to get there. They want to be this. Well, who, when you break it down, no one do, does it better than I do. I'm not living in the, in the lives of the others. I certainly know it because it's fucking hard. And not everyone has the will to do it. I do have. I can sacrifice a lot and become very comfortable in an uncomfortable situation. It was, uh, it was so scary when we had Bienve on, wasn't it? And we, we mentioned this same thing because there was, I think Jing mentioned the same, this is before the season started. And he, he was sort of saying, look, it's a condensed season. Like um, the target's on your back. We, um, if we've only got four games or five games and it's all going to be on the line, is the pressure going to be too big? And, and Bienve was just talking about, you know, well, when I go on vacation, I go on vacation to recharge my battery so I'm fully fit and ready to go. You know, like, and, and that's when I said, look, that's ominous. If you've got one of the best players in the league thinking like that, then what does it say when he's of that level and he's already trying to get more out of him? You know, when you've got a player, exactly what you were saying, if you've got a player who's a four or five out of 10 and he's behaving and training like he's a four out of 10, then you're not going to make up that difference. And I think when you've got multiple players on your team and obviously you are probably the main component and the person who's driving that and insisting that everyone else is like that, then that's when it's a problem for everyone else in the league. You know, if, you're, if you have less ability than these individuals, you've got to be working twice as hard. Do you know what I mean? So I think that's what's worrying for everyone else who's in the league is watching these podcasts, you've seen the social media posts, he's having a look around at their team and thinking, my gosh, if this is the mindset of the best players in the league, then we need to double, triple, quadruple our efforts because otherwise that gap is just going to continue to get bigger. And that's what I think is, is, is really ominous because the only time that's going to change is if something dramatic happens. And the only thing I can think of right now is if you don't come back or if someone else, you know, if Bienve don't come back or, if, you know, one of the things that's been really sad this week is obviously we've seen OJ um, announce that he's potentially going to depart. So, you know, my, my question to you really is, and, and, and maybe it's a bit of a loaded question is, is this ever going to stop this relentlessness that, that, that you guys have seen to put in place? Because from the outside looking in, it just doesn't seem like it's going to happen. Well, not from my side. If, you, if you're wearing the same jersey as I do, I'll make sure you come in shape. I'll make sure you will put in the work. Because if you'll if you be seen with me, you're related to me. And it reflects my, my uh, role model status on, on the team. So if someone is not in shape, I will tell him straight into the face. Like I was not there when they started training. I'm not mentioning names here, but I saw videos of the first, or footage of the first training um, back in Manila. I got straight on the phone and said, look, these three guys, if you don't, if you don't lose weight, if you don't put in the work, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill you when I'm back. I'm going to kill you, literally. Because this is not something I can deal with. I'm 34 years old. I've, I've won everything. 
I have two kids, I have a family, I have a life, I have a social life. I was over in Germany, I could just relax and enjoy the time, but I did not. I did not. I got stressed out every morning, I bring the kids to school, I go to the gym. After I drop the kids out of school, I go to the gym for two hours, go home, rest, spend time with my wife, go to lunch. Afternoon session at a club, evening session at, at another club. Like sometimes I would not even shower after like, this is really <laughs> I had to rush to the car to make the next session to be on time, you know? This is what I do. So if I can do it, why not everyone else can do it, you know? I only breathe oxygen like everyone else does. I only have two legs like every other player has in my team. But if you sign with, to be my teammate, you better make sure that you live up to the expectations I have to myself and to you because otherwise you will have a big, big problem. In a team picked up with these players we have, like coming out, I want to be the best in my team first, to become the best, best in the league, because I feel like our team is blessed with very, very crafty players. Bienve, Mike, Manu, Tak, Pika. These are players that are like big, big time. Big, everyone would love to sign them. To having them in the team is really, drives you somewhere at the place where, where like if, I, if you have Taka in the team, you know, he's, you, you are never, I don't know if you played against him, but yeah. in training, it's, it feels literally like you can't touch him. It's impossible to get the ball from him. It's impossible to see something which leads to a mistake. He is just a composed, very, very skillful player. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So I see him, I see Bienve, I see Mike, I see Mano. I want to beat them. I beat them in every training. I want to beat them in every training. I want to go home and say I was better than him, 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 him. I'm not saying I, I, I score, I dribble, pass all the defenders. I do it all on myself. The, over, the, whole, the whole thing you have to see, where, where I could make my teammates look good, defense work, which is a big, big topic, you know? I, this year I played most, more or less six or eight in our squad, which is not the ideal position, but I make the best out of it. I try. You know, the, it, it requires a lot of dirty work with no one would notice. Mm -hmm. But I love it. I embrace it. And if it helps my team to win titles, to win games, I do it. So we have a lot of competitiveness in our team already. That makes me drive me every day going harder and harder. Because this is, in the end of the day, like I said, gives me the confidence to go out there and be vocal with what I want. Brilliant. I, I, I never really envisaged this being a, a podcast about mentality, but it's been a great <laughs> insight, Jing, isn't it? Like, honestly, like, I, I, I listen to, to loads of different podcasts about, you know, the psychology of the athlete. And, you know, we, we have a lot of young kids that listen to this, Rocky, and, you know, that, that's just trying to emphasize that point of you have to live it. You know, you need to provide evidence that you know, anyone can say, oh, I want to be a professional footballer or I want to be an ASCAL or I want to be the best player in the Philippines. But, you know, you've got to provide the evidence that you're working towards that goal. And if you're not going to the gym every day or if you're not working hardest in training, if you're not doing the extra work, if you're not doing the extra reps, then, then the evidence isn't building up. The only evidence that you're building up is the fact that you're not going to get to the destination that you say you want to get to. So for me, Jing, I know this wasn't how we, we you know, we never intended on being a sports psychology podcast, but it, it's been a massively insightful uh, way to, to sort of delve into the mind of, of someone who's arguably one of the best players the Philippines ever had. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm turning in this, this shirt later. I'm going for a jog, man. I'm feeling pumped up just, just listening <laughs> to Stefan talk, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One thing that you mentioned earlier that I, I want to jump into a little bit, and we'll delve off um, our topic at the moment, was that you said you spent a lot of time in the bubble speaking to Anton, speaking to Coco, speaking to Paul, speaking to movers and shakers in the Philippine football scene. You know, that, those are some very interesting conversations. You know, I, I would love to have been there to listen to you guys speak about what you think is next, what you think should be done, what could be done. Uh, what you guys are planning to do to, to collaborate is there can you open a window can we peek inside unfortunately not these are <laughs> insights 
These are inside bubble things, you know. We we'll probably put out another co- podcast for this one. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it was very great. You know, it's so easy to judge for people from the outside, and even I was one of them. Before I was sitting down with Coco, it's so easy to judge of some decisions or mm-hmm. on, on on why this happened or uh, what is Ed doing or what is why is this one not around or why 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 why. It's so easy to point out once they deliver the product, but you have to know what what happened behind the scene. Coco? If I would be Coco, after the bubble, I would go on two weeks dolphin therapy. So he was on the phone, on the iPad, on, on his uh, MacBook for like 24 hours to, to get this thing done. And it's, uh, it was a great, a great leap, really great. And uh, we probably can thank him enough for his effort, for what he has done for the football community. But imagine, imagine a year without football in the Philippines. There are some other in owners of the club going like, you know what? I'm paying the players for 12 months. I'm not having a printing machine, printing 1,000 peso notes at home. So why should I burn money for them? That's another 30 unemployed people. Another 30 dreams crashed. So Coco pulled this off in order with the PFF, with, with whoever was involved. I don't know, but he had really really 25 hours work a day to to make this thing happen and he did great same goes to paul to ernie to the owners of mendiola to the people behind the scenes maharlika unbelievable adt what can i say heads down to them no one beside of search got really injured yeah. and, 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 and search once was like an, an, an impact he, he i think he someone felt Dylan was it, I think, felt on his, his mm-hmm. ankle. That's why he got this fracture. But no one got injured. This is an indicator that everyone was working. Everyone put in the work towards this league. Everyone stayed, in a sense, disciplined to, to make this thing happen. And it starts down there. And the quality, to be honest, when I, when I was leading towards the, the league, I thought like after 40 minutes, the game would just go be like 5v5 on each half. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't. Both all teams put out a performance, sold themselves really, really well. Really well. Great players. It it looks so easy, you know. I have friends over in Germany. They say like, oh, you you have to win tonight against Stallions, and then after the game, I get a message like, what the hell, seven one? What is that? Then no one ever ripped apart a team like Stallions Laguna seven one before. This is what we give. We were very, very uh, efficient and cold in front of the goal. Literally every attack we played was a perfect touch, the perfect decision, the perfect shot. But no one ever did this and no one ever will. Because Ernie is a crafty coach and he made sure that his team is ready. He was unlucky with, uh, he had some COVID cases, I think, in the team. And then they were quarantined. And then obviously a few five days in a room locked in, moving so well. It's hard to, to get your body in shape, but heads down to everyone, really. It's unbelievable. And we're very, all the players, everyone, from a sub to, to the superstars, so grateful that we could have had a stage where we can perform and, and uh, entertain the people. And it helped the football. 100% helped the football. I mean, in, in fact, it grew the stock, you know, from, from being somewhere where it felt like this wasn't going to happen to now people are looking at football like, men. they... They pulled it off. They managed to do it. And I think that's the key there is that if you can pull it off in this environment, what can they do when things get better? And if sponsors and other people can think in along those lines, then some exciting things are going to happen. Um, as you mentioned, Coco, um, the, 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 the thing that I appreciated the most about him throughout this whole campaign was that whenever I see him, he's all relaxed. He's, you know, he's sitting down, relaxed on the sidelines. And I'm like, I know. I know how much work you've been doing, but you're relaxed here because you're not afraid of what work or what can come up, what, what roadblock, what curveball is coming because you're secure that you'll be able to handle it. And that, that gives confidence to all of us to understand that, hey, this is the guy that he should be stressed out. His shoulders should be very, very heavy, but he's here showing us that it's no problem. And he's also on the pitch doing the things that the little things that need to be done. Fixing the A board. Sometimes he does it. 
Who yeah. does that? Which which commissioner? Show me, right? So it's it's what that's what excites me, you know, is not just that there was a league, but the the personalities, the building blocks for a bigger, a much bigger competition is there already. It's in place. So now, you know, and, and individuals like yourself who are understanding also and seeing the b- behind the scenes and perhaps can contribute to making it easier for us in the future. That's huge. That's, that's big for the, for the game, you know, and not something that we've had or enjoyed over the last few years. So, yeah, um, quite, quite interesting next few months to understand well, which way your ship is sailing, you know, where, where, where will Stefan Schrock end up in the next few, few months? So I, we're all holding our breath, but we appreciate the time that you've, you've spent here with us and to, to share your thoughts. Thank you for having me. It's great. Now, I've said this before. Um, I said it with Phil. I said it with James. Uh, and I've had you thrown into that mix as well. If, if you're a Filipino fan, uh, you know, you've got to come out and watch you. You know, they've got to come out and see you. See whether we tune into the Facebook, tune in um, on the YouTube, come visit him live whenever it's, uh, it's available and possible because this isn't going to happen forever. You know, people just assume that these guys, oh, they'll be around forever. This is a, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity and there only is a small window where you can enjoy these people. So enjoy it while they can, while you can, because man, when it's gone, you're going to miss them. You're going to miss these guys. So, you know, I really appreciate you coming on. I really, really appreciate you um, giving another, I say two weeks of your service, but I know it was a lot longer than that behind the scenes as well. And just from a selfish perspective, you know, I don't just want to see you in national team colours. I want to see you here, um, you know, on the domestic shores and find a flag in, in Asian Champions League. But I also understand that the wife and kids are, are always the priority. So, um, you know, I'm sure you won't take that decision lightly. But for whatever happens, you know, thank you for, for all the services that you put in over the previous years and especially this year, because I know it couldn't have been easy for you. So hats off to you also, sir, uh, for coming on and for everything you've done for the domestic game. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> we, look to, uh, we look forward to having you back on whenever um, some interesting news pops up. Stefan, absolute pleasure being able to meet you and speak to you today. If you guys are um, interested in looking more into Stefan Schrock, where should they go? Chris, where should they go? Can oh, visit BGC. <laughs> BGC. He's, he's, he's running, he's working out on BGC. He's, he's quite prominent on social media, if you haven't yeah. checked him out before. He's not very quiet, so if you want to know the real him, check out the post. That's the one to go to, right? So there you have it. Um, really enjoyed this one. If you folks at home listening to this and, and tuned into this, uh, enjoyed this conversation with Stefan Schrock, please do subscribe to the show. We're on YouTube, Spotify, and on Apple Podcasts. We're also on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and on Instagram. Drop us a line. Tell us what you think about this episode. We'd appreciate to hear from you. And that is it for us on this Football Friday. We'll catch you next time.